This is the final Sunday in Lent before we start the Holy Week, and the coming Sunday will be Palm Sunday. And the Word of God this Sunday focuses on the nearness of the hour of Jesus, who is to establish a new covenant, meaning the hour of glorification, suffering, death, and resurrection to save us all. Brothers and sisters, reflecting on the new covenant and this hour, the hour of Jesus, we know that in a contrast, in a contract, the question to ask is, when you make a contract with someone, the question you ask yourself, what can I get in this contract? And you push so much to get something out of that contract. And most times you make a contract with someone you don't really fully trust. But a covenant, in a covenant the question to answer is, what can I give? Because a covenant relationship, like a husband and wife, what can I give? It's a relation, kind of a relationship. A give, a give. What am I ready to give? A contract is a kind of a transaction, and a covenant is a relationship. When God enters a covenant with us, he gives all. When he enters a covenant with us, he's ready to give all. There are several covenants between God and his people in the Bible. And of course, before this, we know people make covenants with the devil and other things and all that, with money, with whatever, with material things. They give themselves to those kind of evil things. But God gives, make, made, a, made covenants with his people, as written in the Bible. Notably among them, uh, it was the covenant between God and Noah, the Noahic covenant when he made a covenant with his people and said, I no longer destroy this nation after the great flood. And then we know the covenant with Abraham. I will give you a great nation as many as the stars in heaven. And he promised that. And then we know the Mosaic covenant on Mount Sinai. When God made a covenant with his people, gave them a new commandments. And uh, they say, he said, you'll be my people and I'll be your God. And all, the, all of them said, amen. Then Moses sacrificed lambs and other animals, sprinkled blood over them to seal that covenant. We know the covenants that God made with David, his servant, and many other covenants in the Bible. Of these covenants, the Mosaic covenant, that is the covenant at Mount Sinai, through the instrumentality of Moses, stands out as a defining moment for the nation of Israel. Very important moment when he made a covenant with his people. The fruit of that covenant was a series of laws to guide the Israelites. Laws put on tablets to guide, to govern the Israelites. Unfortunately, infidelity on the part of the nation of Israel to the demands of the covenant marred a beautiful relationship with God because they broke the relationship with God. They destroyed the covenant. The need for a new covenant now arose. And so, in the first reading today, from Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, we hear through, through Jeremiah, God, promised, God promising to make a new covenant, a new covenant, and an everlasting covenant. He said, Behold, the days are coming, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, and remember I said a covenant is a relationship, not so much of a contract, 
the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I'll put my laws within them and they, they write and they, I write it upon their hearts. And I'll be, and I'll be their God. They shall be my people. Amen? That was a covenant after the Israelites had broken the Sinai covenant that God had made with them. Now Jeremiah comes out and he pronounces a new covenant that God will make with his people. The expression of the new covenant as we hear it in the book of Jeremiah is very unique in very way, many ways. It appears to be the only place in the whole Bible, in the whole scripture, the Old Testament, where the expression is employed, a new covenant. Secondly, unlike the decalogue that was given on Mount Sinai, on tablets that would be written on that was written on tablets, the Ten Commandments, this one is to be written upon on human hearts. They will know God within themselves. There will not be any need for some to tell them to know and love God. We are here because we know God and we know the right thing to do. It's written on our hearts. The new covenant relationship with God. We know him from the least to the greatest. Thirdly, this new covenant would establish a relationship not just within a community in the general sense of the word, but within individuals. And fourthly, it's a covenant characterized by God's mercy and, forgive, and forgiveness. I will forgive their sins. I will be merciful to them. Amen? That's the new covenant that Jeremiah talks about in his chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. The author of the book of the letter of the Hebrews in the second reading and the whole book presents Jesus as the high priest of this new covenant. And in the second reading, we have an image of a high priest who endured the great suffering to ensure that a new relationship, a new covenant is established between God and humanity. He says, during his life on earth, Christ suffered up, Christ offered up prayers and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was hard. Although he was a son, he learned to obey through suffering. To do what? To establish a covenant. But having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Amen? He had to undergo a lot of suffering to establish a new covenant between humanity and God. He had to go through suffering, entreaty, silent tears. We know how Jesus cried even on the cross, Father, if this cup can pass, not my will, but that your will be done. It wasn't easy to redeem us, to save us. It costed Jesus' life, his most precious blood, sealed in his most precious blood, no longer in the blood of the animals that were slaughtered by Moses. Now this is a new covenant that was sealed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, on Calvary. Amen? That is it. A new covenant. And the gospel text that we have heard this morning affirms this point. We heard the gospel reading from St. John, chapter 12, verse 20 to 30. The Passover being one of the three major feasts, the three major feasts of the Jews, because they remembered on this day that moment when God saved them from, his, from Egypt, the Passover meal, and how they were saved 
and they were, they were able to cross the, the Jordan. They always remembered this event. And so they would go to Jerusalem to sacrifice to God, offer sacrifices to God, sacrifices of lambs and goats and whatever in Jerusalem. So it was one of the major events. And this gospel is written in a view of that uh, environment of remembering to celebrate the Passover as a great event in Israel. So many Jews and Gentiles from all over the world had gathered in Jerusalem. And now the end time of Jesus was also coming. The immediate days leading to the Passover of Jesus were characterized by an influx of people from all walks of life and different nationalities. They had gathered to celebrate the Passover. And Jesus is using this very moment in Jerusalem at such a moment to seal the new covenant between us and our God. With the people coming and going, it dawned on him and he reflected, had a discernment in the hour that the hour, the hour had come for him to offer a singular sacrifice that would establish a new covenant between God and his people. That was the moment. They have come to sacrifice. Now say this is the real moment. So he says, the hour has come. Kairos. Not the chronological kind of time, but this is this Kairos in Greek, a different kind of hour. Acceptable time. God is time. God is infused the moment when all would be accomplished according to God's loving plan. This is the hour. The hour has come. The appointed moment to establish a new covenant between God and his people sealed in the precious blood of Jesus. Amen? So that is the hour he's talking about in the gospel reading. When he cries out, now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you most solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls on the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. Amen? So he's convinced that if I die, if I go through this suffering, many will be saved and they'll establish a relationship between people and their God. And he's ready. Jesus is ready. It is a tough time for Jesus. You can see all these images are closed now. It is a tough time for Jesus. It's a time of passion, suffering. And the Lord is inviting us during this time to pay more attention to what he goes through than looking at the holy images. Pray, but reflect and read the word of God. Read the passion of Jesus and see how much he suffered for us. He's ready. The hours come. Unless the wheat grain dies in the ground, it will not sprout. Unless we die, we shall never see God. We go through that process, brothers and sisters. And so the hours come. Now is my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. He assures himself. For this purpose I have come for this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And the voice was heard from heaven. I have glorified it already. Amen. He is in touch with heavenly father. He is in close touch. A close relationship and ready to establish a new covenant sealed in the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Amen? Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, we are disciples of a new covenant. Can we clap for that? We are disciples of the new covenant sealed in his most precious blood, sealed on Mount Calvary on the cross. When it was done, he said, it is accomplished. Amen? The deal is what? Accomplished on the cross. But it is time, half, half, tough time now for Jesus. It took him a lot 
to accept this hour of glorification. God's appointed time. God's moment. We act right, not because someone or something is done to us is policing us, but because the more we've done, we know from within to do what we are meant to do. Doing what is right is our new nature because we know it's a new covenant. God has written that on our hearts that he's our savior, he's our redeemer. Amen? And he has saved us. God has saved us through the precious blood of his son at that hour, the precious hour, the hour of glorification, the hour of suffering. At this moment, as you see the image is also closed, our life seems to be veiled. In this world, our life is veiled. We don't know. Even at that hour, it's like it was veiled, but only Jesus could discern and say, the time, this is the moment. We can't know what is there that Jesus won for us. But after this life, after this struggle in this life, the veil will be removed and we shall see God face to face as our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. And that is the deepest desire of us all, of any human soul, that the veils are removed at that moment. On Holy Father, the Virgin Mass, we shall remove all the veils and say, yes, he's alive, he's risen. Amen? But now, it is veiled. It is tough time. We need to pray. We need to ask God to create in us a new heart, a pure heart. So all through this week, brothers and sisters, like Psalm 51, we shall say, a pure heart create for me, O God. We pray. A pure heart create for me, O God. A pure heart create for me, O God. May God bless us to appreciate that moment that Jesus saved us. That moment, the appointed time, the hour. It took him a lot, his life, to save us. May he bless us and appreciate and uh, run away from our sins and confess our sins and let Jesus lead us that his law may be written and inscribed in our hearts a relationship with God, a new beginning, a new start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.